Okay, uh, yes, thank you. I'm Nathan, I'm uh, 46, and I'm editor-in-chief of a magazine, uh, and I uh, wrote a book uh, last year, and it was uh, received very well. This is the book, it's called uh, Man o Man, in Dutch, Man o Man. Uh, and the subtitle is, um, you don't fail, you're just doing what you can. So that's just what the book is about, about the idea of failing. First, I'm gonna uh, ask you some questions. Uh, are you all right? <laughs> Who in this audience has ever said, I'm all right, when you actually were not? <laughs> Who of you had a role model who helped you grow up? Who of you thinks you have to solve all the problems yourself? Who of you knows for sure that your father loves you no matter what? Who in this audience thinks he or she is just good enough? Okay, that's two. <laughs> <laughs> Who of you hopes the speaker next time will ask more breakfast kind of questions? <laughs> Okay, I'm here, I'm going to put out my agenda, sorry, um, to talk about anxiety and man. So I happen to research that a little in this book. And I'm not selling anything, I'm not giving a presentation. I actually might read from my laptop. I don't know if that is an offense here, but... Well. Think of this as the, the good old lecture, yeah, good old lecture. Let me begin with a few short stories. Uh, Clemens, he was with Annika since she was 19. And they had two children and were seemingly doing fine. But sometimes claimants would be lying on the couch for a week with the curtains closed, just watching TV, drinking coffee, not working. And if she would ask him what was the matter, he would run out of the house, take the car, have a drive uh, very fast. And she would be very happy that he would come back at all. And she would not ask again. Carla and Arthur, he was a big shot tough, cool banking guy, and she kind of followed him around. Arthur, she told me, he had cried only once when his, their daughter was born. Failing was not an option to him. Talking about work or money or troubles was not an option. And then he lost his job. David, he was the perfect dad for his three sons. He was the ideal husband. He provided for the income, the football practice, he cooked, he did the family stuff. And this was his life, living for others, not for himself, not making mistakes. And he was happy about it. And then something snapped in his head. And we don't know when that happened. Between main course and dessert, Annika and Clemens had a fight, an argument. And he stood up and he ran upstairs. This time she did not follow him. And Annika, she had a bump. And she thought he moved the sofa, couch, and went on cleaning the table. And after 15 minutes, she went up and then she found him. She told me she will never forget the squeaky sound of the rope against the timber. Arthur lost his job and they gave him a lot of money. His pride, though, was torn apart. Alone at their home, he started playing online poker. And in a few weeks, he lost all the money and all the money they'd saved together. And on the day he did hit bottom line, he planned to take his own life. And he wrote a note, but he did not dare to. So he told uh, Carla everything. He confessed what he did. That was the second time she saw him cry, she told me. She had to go out to get the kids, was away for an hour, and then he did there. We know that David got a new job. A job that did not fit him. He was not happy about it and it did not give him all the securities he so desperately needed. He called in sick, got some help, but I think it went down for him too fast, for him and for his loved ones. 
The idea that what kept him going, three little boys, would save him proved to be a wrong idea because his mind had terminated all emotions. Except the one that told David he did not want this life. He did not want this life. He died May 20th, May 20, 2015. And he was my brother. So I, maybe you can, maybe you cannot imagine to drive from west, I live in Amsterdam, to east, uh, Netherlands, on a sunny day, knowing to go and you see your brother lying in his bed, to in a house where you've had all great moments with people you love so much. And when you go there, there's, he's lying in his bed. And downstairs, there is his wife, and there's his mother, and there's sister and the brothers, and we're all defeated, numb. Uh, it's unreal. And his sons were playing with some neighbors they did not know. But something like that happens, and I guess some of you know this, your timeline is split up. So to me, it's before or after May 20, 2015. Forever. And the first week was a, a week of, of course, grieving, comforting others, arranging things for a, for a ceremony. And the first months, maybe you know that, were kind of a shock routine. routine. You just go on and you try not to feel too much. That's how it goes. After the summer, I managed to look up and noticed more Davids around. Not, not suicidal men, but men struggling with life, as I call it, cloyen, which is Dutch word. Those men had not changed, but I saw the pattern. Friend one and two, they were in a depression. We knew that. Friend three just got kicked out of the house by his wife. Friend four celebrated his 20 fifth uh, year of marijuana addiction, yay. Friend five lost his job. Not to mention my three living brothers who all had and still have issues, big issues. Actually decent, polite, quiet David had always been the brother I worried about least. See the irony. This realization and the death of Joost Wageman, who I just had been emailing the day before he died, but most of all, the terrible energy from David's death, which I had to, had to turn around, this powered me to start the research in what become the book Man O oh Man, Man O oh Man. In that research, the first fact I stumbled upon, it was right there, is that men in Holland commit suicide twice as much as women. It's in 2016, 1279 men against 615 women. In the UK, it's three, three times as much used to be five times as much. In some European, uh, Eastern European countries, seven times as much. In the Netherlands, it's the second cause of death after lung cancer for a man between 40 and 60. And those are not alcoholics. Uh, they can be, of course, or divorced or drug addicts. No, they're just men. Men between 40 and 60 are a risk group for suicide. Think about it. I did not know this. And when I found out I was being a journalist, kind of surprised that it was never in the news. It was, it was no news. It was never part of public dis discussion. And that it seemingly just as the fact that men die earlier than women, you know that, in, in general, uh, was not considered an issue. It is what it is. So I started digging, and this is where we get to anxiety. I read a research on su suicide survivors, and all these survivors, they were, as the professor said, socially prescribed perfectionists. I read this article a week after my brother died. I wish I had read it before. And what it means is you mean in a big fear or in a fear what you think people think about you. The problem is you cannot control that. So you want to be perfect, but you don't know what perfect is. You don't need your own life, but you're playing roles. You try to keep up, but you, it will never be enough. You will always fail at the job if you think like that. And that got me thinking, I'm not a perfection, perfectionist, not at all. If I was, and then I would do this by heart, of course. But the idea that I'm failing is a big one. It used to be a big one, I'm better now. The idea that I'm not good enough. And so life sometimes scares the shit out of me. And I, I don't know, maybe you know this feeling. That it scares you because you think you're doing wrong. But what is the standard? What am I? What is good? What is perfect? I don't know that. The idea of not being good enough, 
I think is a dangerous one. It's not very comfortable, of course, most levels, but it can be lethal. That's what I just showed you. And if you're a man, it will probably silence you. Because that's what most men do when they're unhappy. They get quiet. They isolate themselves. Maybe they start drinking. They will mostly not ask for help. Men may even grow an inner rage, an anger that might cause, if not recognized and not directed, a burst either inside, and then it can become a depression or burnout, or outside, and it can become aggression. And we, still, we see many examples in the media, of course, or in the news everywhere around us. Male anxiety, anxiety, fear, turn to anger. Impotence, in the broad sense of the word, or turn to power abuse. And that's why I think Me Too is uh, such a wonderful movement, best concept of this millennium so far, because it will, in the end, I think, empower men. But that's another discussion. So let me get back to my research. I interviewed Annika, and I interviewed Carla, and I interviewed nine other women, so 11 in total. They all lost their husbands to suicide. And they were all normal guys with a family and a job and an income. And none of them, none of them had a psychiatric problems, big psychiatric problems. No, not an acute depression. They all had problems, of course. Otherwise, they would be living right now. But they, they don't have a severe depression. And all their stories were completely different. I'm not trying to, if you read my book, I'm not trying to prove anything by those stories. Except that it can happen. But their stories were different except for two things. These men thought they were not good enough, that they were failing at the job, failing being a father, or a husband, or an employee, or a son even. The other thing, the other common thing I will tell you later. So why is this? Okay, I want to make a detour and look at the glass ceiling. You know all the glass ceiling concept, right? Uh, well, women know. Um, and on the glass ceiling uh, there are supposed to be a few men on top and almost no women. But there's also a glass floor. And under this glass floor, you will see hardly any woman. There you will find the criminals, the addicted, the homeless, the alcoholics, the loners, unhealthy. Almost all of them men. And the saying goes, men, more nobles, Nobel Prize winners, but not more dumbbells, more stupid guys. And I'm not a scientist, but I think the fact that the glass thing and the idea that men are failing at the job and cannot deal with it has something to do with biology and social evolution. Dangerous territory, always be careful with this, but stay with you for a moment. We can go in the discussion afterwards. A female, uh, Homo sapiens, produces about 400 good egg cells in her life. One every month, as half of this audience knows. Uh, and a man is able to manufacture about 200 million, <laughs> you're looking amazed now, uh, sperm cells a day. A day. He, 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 he's able to do that. In other words, if technique would provide and we would have a shitty society, uh, one guy would be able to uh, impregnate all women on this planet and have weekends, elf and evenings. Elf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, men, in other words, are kind of unnecessary for the species. Species homo sapiens. We don't need that much man. And very deep, 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 deep down, deep down, men know this. They feel it. They don't think about it, they feel it. That our presence, my presence, is not needed. And that if you want to live on, we have to fight. We have to conquer other men to secure our offspring, to secure who we are. And this is all deep down, of course. I, I, I don't think any of you gets up in the morning and thinks, But that's why we are not shocked, not so much shocked, about millions of men dying in wars. Men die in wars. That's what happens. Of course, not if it's your son or your, or your um, husband, but men die in wars. If women die in wars. We get scared and we shoot. Men die in stupid accidents all the time. Men die from unhealthy habits. And this is where the difference comes from a lot, you know? The lung cancer, the heart problems, uh, obese. And that's maybe also why we took, take for granted that men commit suicide. 
more often than women. And men, in fact, are doing worse than women in that uh, perspective. A man knows, I'm repeating it, subconsciously he must fight to win. But there's a, always a possibility of losing. Of course, when you win, you can lose. So he wants maybe to reach the glass ceiling, but he might, under, uh, uh, might end up under the glass floor. And that's why a man, and this is where the problem gets bigger, cannot, is unable to show his vulnerability. Oh, I'm glad I got that word outright. Uh, or his weakness. Because he's, if he does that, if he lowers his shield, and think of it as a shield, he is losing. He thinks he's losing. Because other men will be stronger and they will win. So this is why man, man does not ask for help. This is why man in despair keeps it to himself. Says, I'm alright. He starts drinking instead of talking. Do you know, that was uh, another uh, thing I found in my research, that women are two times as much depressed as men in Holland. But men commit suicide two times as much. Well, just think for yourself for two seconds and you know what the problem is. It's all about this. Talking. Feeling. In my research, I uh, encountered a report on suicide, another report by Professor Mark Williams. I'm going to quote him. And it says, suicidal behavior rep represents a response to a feeling of being defeated combined with a feeling of not being able to escape the consequences of that defeat. Like an animal caught in a trap, the struggle to be free is followed by defeat and hopelessness. Okay, this does not cheer you up. I can see that. Women, I dare to say, are less used to think in acts uh, or act in terms of victory or defeat. They realize, as society is more and more these days, thank God, that's worse, uh, that relations are more fertile and lasting than power. The question for most women is not, can, are you better than me? Can I beat you? But more, can I trust you? How are things between us? What do I feel about this? I think this is a difference. We're getting to the second part. About 10 minutes ago I asked you if any of you had someone to help you grow up. And if you were sure your father loves you. Could be a mother as well. I ask that because I think there's another, different, another difference between men and women. And there's a solution right there. Did you realize, I didn't realize until I started this, that most men modern men in this society don't really grow up. They do not have specific conscious moments where they learn to how to deal with life, to establish a relation between themselves and the world. Boys don't have their first period or any period. They don't get breasts and people looking at them and then <coughs> dealing with it. They don't give labor. And they usually did not have the obvious role model to guide them from childhood to adulthood. The father being out of the house since the Industrial Revolution and into the factory or the office. The master disappearing from the school. Nothing wrong with that. Don't get me wrong. But should it not it be a big man's job to raise a little man? Because he knows what it felt like. Not that mothers doing anything wrong, but shouldn't fathers be doing that? And did a lot of men, I did, miss it. A lot of boys in our society had to find out for themselves how to become a man. Which, if they were unlucky, some unhealthy options. There's the smoking, there's the drinking, there's the driving, there's the bragging about sex, about power, about women, there's the fighting, there's destroying, there's joining a jihad, eh? used to be a big thing in the last 10 years, or other ways to prove their manhood. And if he was lucky, he had a dad, or a mum, or both or a teacher who helped him grow up, who learned him to build a house, I use it metaphorically of course, to make a fire, to take care of others, to deal with his passion, the passion here, you know, think about the cells, to work with all the emotions, you know, the big ones, the fear, the anger, also happiness. This wasn't the case for me or my brother David or any of the 11 men whose widows I interviewed. That's the second thing they had in common. 
A lot of men, I dare to say, are still quite unaware of who they are and what it means to be human or a man and which purpose they have in life. It's a big question, of course. They don't know how to face big problems if they arrive. And that's where they can get anxious. And they never learn to deal with that emotion, anxiety. I do not have answers here. Uh, I had some questions. You heard them at the beginning and there's some more in my book. But I do have some suggestions aimed at men, of course, but free and usable for everyone. First, if there's a chance of improving the relationship with your father, do so. Try not to blame him or ask him for justification what he did do or did not do. But start to understand what he did. Just ask him what he did when he was your age, for instance. And why he did it. And what his feelings were when he did that. And at the end, you might ask him if he never said it, do you love me? No matter what. A lot of fathers were not able to say that. And I guess he wants to say it. I guess he does love you. And I guess he wants in return to love uh, you want, uh, want you to love him too. So then you can end this son asking for his father's, you know. You can fill in mother as well. The second step, and that's what I also encountered during my research, maybe it's better for a man, but maybe also for women, to find a male way to search yourself, to get to know your feelings. And that's not by endless talking, sofa sessions or mindfulness, therapist, yoga, Nothing wrong with that, but a lot of men don't deal with that very well. Maybe you better try to be, or even better do. So go out, actually really go out into the woods. Chop woods, climb that mountain, build a castle, and if you're not afraid, really search your soul. I myself am a bit afraid of drugs, quite so. But last year I tried clean MDMA, you know, the stuff in ecstasy, which uh, kind of split your mind in two. On the sofa, and I was with a blindfolded and I was with a uh, dealer well, slash therapist <laughs> uh, <laughs> next to me. Um, and and I, I, I wanted to search myself the quick way, not talking, but just, I, I just put down a half of my brain, the, the rational part, and I let go and I entered all emotions. And on that trip, I met my long deceased dad. He's been dead for 17 years now. And we talked to, to each other, and we hugged, and we said goodbye, and we said we loved each other. And it was amazing. But don't do this at home, it's careful stuff. <laughs> but I did it, and I was happy about it. Third, the struggling man, my subject, is not a subject at all in non-fiction or literature, of our non-fiction and, and science. But literature is all about it. I don't know if you know that. It's all about it, from Homer to J.D. Salinger to whatever. It's men, mostly men, trying to cope with youth, with life, with others, with death. It is the historic backbone of the fiction. So I would recommend always have a novel with you, just in your bag, inside your bed. Reading good fiction helps you deal with love and fear because it will show you that you're not alone. That's what a good book does. Four is an obvious one, but researching and writing and talking about man on man, man on man, I felt it in my heart, I felt it for the first time, and they set yourself a goal, you know all this, just almost out of reach, a goal that will lift you up, and it will lift up the people you love, actually. And to make it easy, there's just one category of goals, just one, and it's to make the world a little better. That's all. And if you try that, you can never fail. Nothing better for inner peace than a goal. And the last one, I especially reserve this for this crowd, so it's very exclusive. Uh, use the energy and turn it around. Evil power knocked me out almost when David died. You know, he was my brother. He was my younger brother. I loved him. I was almost knocked out, like the, the rest of my family. But I took that power, 
that energy, force, whatever you name it. And I reversed it. I directed, redirected it. So for the world, for you maybe, it was to try to stop more suicides, to make his suicide stop other suicides. For me, of course, it was dealing with what happened. And I'm still not there yet, but okay, I'm trying. And together it was to turn evil into good. I wrote a book in one year, on evenings and weekends, and I have a 60 hour job. But I had to do it, so don't wait. So if you encounter a big power, be it evil, be it good, be it whatever, make it your own the moment you can, and direct it the right way. Don't wait too long. Annika, she's doing okay these days. She just emailed me this morning. She has two children, she found a new love. And uh, of course she still feels the pain every day. And she's, she's holding on. Same goes for Carla, also two kids, but she's doing fine. And what she does, they're doing and all those women are doing, they try to live a life as uncomplicated as possible. Small. But they all have a big scar. My family, um, they are back on its feet. My mother, my sister-in-law, my nephews, they are lagging behind, of course, because they feel the absence of David every day. Well, I got the chance to make something out of it. There's lots more to say, not just by me. Uh, and there's lots more to find out. I mentioned Me Too earlier. And I think that should be, it can be, it must be uh, uh, an impulse to do a new search on what a man is actually like. Why, why does a man do what he does? We all wonder about it. And I'd be happy to be a part of that search. So, feel free to contact me about that or any other things. And meanwhile, you can contribute to the Man on Man Foundation I just recently created to reduce depression and suicide among men and to provide for a little tuition for my sons, uh, my nephews, the sons of David. So in the back there is a list uh, where you can uh, put your name on and then I will, if you want I will send you a book and if you uh, really want I will even sign it and if you don't want that's okay by me too. And uh, so all the proceeds go there and uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>